using seismic waves to communicate is the equivalent of it feels like a dolphin using mm, sonic waves to communicate through ocean. There's something right. really incredible about that that we don't understand. I mean, that's that's a really interesting concept. I mean, there's a lot of species that we've seen with remote viewing that have some type of location that is strategy to find things based off of pulsing energy or energy coming to them. So the electrolocation is a very interesting concept. Kind of like the debates we have with Bigfoot and some of these other things as to whether or not it could be real. And then eventually it was found that the platypus is a real thing. A creature with the body of an otter, the bill and feet of a duck, and the tail of a beaver. Sounds like a mythical creature, or chimera. That's what people once thought that the platypus was, and oh boy, is it a weird one. And it's not the only animal with weird characteristics. Why are the capuchin, monkeys of Costa Rica, enthralling scientists with their bonding behavior? And why does no one know why capuchin monkeys spend hours doing this strange activity each day? And elephants are known to be gentle giants, but what is it about their physiology that makes them more sensitive than possibly any land animal on Earth? Join me, remote viewer John Vivanco, and investigative researcher Rob Counts for a show that's out of this world. Are you listening to the Metaphysical Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or elsewhere? Leave us a five-star rating and review to help us reach even more people. And remember, you've got to like, follow, and subscribe on YouTube, Rumble, Ganjing World, Twitter, and Facebook. John, how you doing? Good. I'm doing good. I'm good. Liking, liking the aminals. Yeah. Yeah, the am and aminals. Yeah. Pretty, pretty fun subject. Um, speaking of animals and... Weird animals, I guess. Have you have you ever heard of a chimera? What a chimera is? Is that an animal? <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of. Um, Isn't that the ancient Greek? Yeah, it is the ancient Greek <clears throat> Atlantean concoction. Yes. Hey, whoa! You hit that pretty. pretty I know. Here's fast. another yeah. avenue. <clears throat> it's a you know Greek mythology. It's got the head of a lion, a goat's body, and a serpent's tail. So this sort of amalgamation of different animals and one animal was considered a chimera, right? The subject is, I guess, always fascinated people. This idea that that more than one animal could make up, you know, it's sort of, you know, in a way, griffins are, are similar. It's like an eagle's head, a lion's body, right? Well, there's, there's a lot of that in mythology, well, so-called right. mythology, where it's got the combination of a bird and a lion and there's all these stories around these <clears throat> types of creatures. Um, the the Unzu, Unzu bird, which stole the Tablets of Destiny, for instance, from en or Enlil, either Enki or Enlil. I think it was Enlil. And um, wanted to be like the so-called gods, right? Um, and went insane, kind of went insane because it was a more of a mortal type creature and the tablets caused him to go somewhat insane. But there's a lot of that type of being uh, involved throughout all of like these mythological, so-called mythological texts. Then you have like the four faces of God, which is the lion, the human, the bird, ox, or, or a cow, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen this stuff like in remote viewing too, where it's like, it, 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 it almost seems like it's probably some interdimensional, multidimensional type of creature. Yeah. And, and, and Sorry, I just like went down this huge rabbit hole. No, <laughs> it's great. I mean, there's also like all of these chimeras, I guess you could say, that have been debated in the in the ocean as well, where where different mer beings have been reported or have been on maps where it's like the head of a fish, the bottom of a human being. Right. Um, 
the the you know fins or the the tail of a dolphin or and then the the upper body of a of a human these are normal mermen or mermaids right um these have been reported throughout history what if what if there was some truth to it i mean we don't i don't know i don't know what's in that ocean and there's a reason i think they don't they don't study these things and we have multiple cultures reporting things similar to mermaids you know most strongly in papua new guinea where they have this creature called the re and they even sell re meat in their in their uh farmers markets that the that the what fishermen are what, re meat re meat they sell it, it is, in their okay so you're basically eating some kind of mer mer creature yeah it'd be like um their description of the re is sort of like if a mermaid was a meth addict for a while <laughs> Like it's like the redneck of mermaids in in a way that only could exist probably in Papua New Guinea. No, no, all right. Well, okay. So I got to write, I mean, I got to write that down. The redneck of mermaids. Yeah. The redneck yeah, it's of a, mer- that's a strange quote rap. from Rob, the redneck it's, of mermaids. Right. Yeah. You, you leave it to me to find the redneck of, right. of any creature in, in the world. I'll find oh, it. Man. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a a part of me that just it just will always be a redneck. I think I think yeah. all men have a little bit of that, you know. Oh yeah. Like when you get in front of a fire or whatever it is, it's just this part of you that comes out, you know. But yeah, so strange, um, strange beings have been considered chimeras um, over time, and. Yeah, there's one being in particular that was considered a myth. It was even considered a cryptid or the like before it was actually found. And that is, believe it or not, a platypus. Because a platypus basically has the beak of a duck. It has the tail of a beaver and the hands of something like an otter naturalists and scientists and most Europeans in the 18th century didn't believe such a creature could actually exist. Okay, so the second governor of New South Wales, Captain John Hunter, sent a pelt and a sketch of a platypus to scientists of the European community in 1798, shortly after one was discovered. So he sent the actual pelt of this thing, right? Zoologist, anatomist, Ethologist and physician Robert Knox was convinced it was a hoax and that the pelt was made by an Asian taxidermist. I guess the Asians were the best at taxidermy. I'm not really sure. Because, you know, he's getting a dried pelt. You know, this thing is like flattened out. It's just the skin of this thing. And I think, you know, obviously Hunter was like, they're not going to believe me unless I send evidence of this thing. So he skins the thing and he sends it along. Easiest thing to fly by mail, let's say, because it's got no weight. He can basically just send it. It's not going to stink in the mail or by ship or wherever he sent it. And then Knox gets it and he is basically convinced that this thing is a hoax. Like it it has to be fake. He even convinced botanists and, and a zoologist named George Shaw, who at the time believed the platypus could be real, but had doubts to take scissors to the pelt and find stitches because it had to have been sewn together. It's kind of like the jackalope. Yeah, right. Right. (laughs) There was a few of these things like throughout history that, you know, similar to the jackalope, right? Yeah. And the platypus is, is one of them. Um, okay. So here's where it gets weird. Have you ever looked into the capabilities of a platypus? No, I haven't. I haven't looked into platypus at all. Okay, so just to end the story that I was just telling, eventually, obviously, the platypus was found to be a real thing, and it could no longer be denied, okay? But there was a lot of debate before, kind of like the debates we have with Bigfoot and some of these other things as to whether or not it could be real. And then eventually it was found that the platypus is a real thing. Platypuses are probably some of the most interesting creatures on the planet based off of what they do. They have an ability called electrolocation. They have receptors in their bills that allow them to detect electric signals from their prey underwater. Wow. 
Oh, yeah. that's interesting. So electrolocation. Electrolocation. You know, I mean, that's that's a really interesting concept. I mean, there's a lot of species that we've seen with remote viewing that have, well, some type of location that is strategy to find things based off of pulsing energy or energy coming to them. So the electrolocation is a very interesting concept. I had not, I, I, I had never heard of electrolocation in an it animal. Get, it gets weirder. It's going to get weirder. All right. They're one of the only mammals that lays eggs. It's still, it lays eggs. It's like a duck. Okay. This is why this thing is such a chimera. Okay. Weirdest maybe of all, platypuses have something called biofluorescence. They glow blue under ultraviolet light. I wonder what that's for. That's strange. I have a theory and I'll get to it. Okay. So other animals do have this biofluorescence trait. Sea turtle shells, fungi, uh, flying squirrels actually are biofluorescent. I did not know that. Flying squirrels, really? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's my theory. Biofluorescence is the phenomena whereby a substance such as fur absorbs light at one wavelength and then emits it at a different wavelength, in this case, a blue wavelength. Hmm. Yeah. So it's absorbing it and then it's giving it back in another, in another shade. So it's almost like some kind of um, stealth or holographic technology. Huh. That's really interesting. You know, there's like these, there's like some reports of like Dogman, for instance, where it seems like there is some type of, um, there could be some biofluorescence akin type ability in the fur of Dogman that causes them to be darker than what they are. I mean, I've heard this report before. Wow. Huh. That's a really interesting, really interesting development on these guys. Okay. So, so what, what's your theory on it? Yeah. So there's, so there's a couple of theories. One is uh, some ideas that just scientists have had on why they can do this include some type of camouflage or communication between other platypuses. But one thing that I found is that and this is really weird. Platypus, they close their eyes underwater when they dive. Okay. So if that's true, are these little buggers seeing one another with some other form of extrasensory ability? Right. Think about it. They would be able to detect or see other platypuses and then know what to attack if they're diving and their eyes are closed. Right. How right. to get food. Yeah. Wow. That's really, that's really curious. That's something actually I'm going to have to look into. Like why? Yeah. Wow. Super interesting. Very strange. And such weird little creatures. I mean, well, have you ever seen their hands? Their hands are like these like webbed hands that look a lot like an otter's. The, it has a beaver tail. And then just, it's literally the entire thing is a cross between a beaver and otter with just this like duck muzzle on it. So platypuses have eyes above their bill. So they're not able to see things directly below them. Skin flaps cover the platypus's eyes and ears underwater, which means it's temporarily blind when swimming. Instead, the platypus uses its bill to feel its way and find food underwater. And you got to wonder like where this, where this creature comes from, where did it evolve from? How did it, like, how did it evolve this way? I mean, okay. So think like the wavelengths that humans perceive it's very narrow band, right? And there are all these other wavelengths. I mean, our cameras catch like a portion of some of these wavelengths, how many animals, and there's really almost no way to know. How many animals capture more wavelengths? You know, quite, quite a few of them do, I'm sure, where they perceive things. I mean, like, I remember when I was a kid, for instance, my house was somewhat haunted. In my brother's room, the cats would never go in there because at one point in time, they were in the room, 
they looked up to the corner of the room and they just started hissing, 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 hissing up in the upper corner and ran out and then would never go in again after that. I mean, that's seeing into another wavelength. Obviously, like there's something weird and negative there. And I don't know. I honestly believe that that we have humans have the ability to do that. We just like shut it down because of our own social constraints around what exists and what doesn't exist. But if you laid it out, like how many animals have these weird things going on that we just don't know about? And why? How did that develop? You know? Dolphins are supposedly um, supposed to see with 100% of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Who knows what they're looking at? Who know? And we'll get into dolphins right. later on, but dude, like we have no idea what those guys are looking at. Like we see a tiny uh, percentage of the electromagnetic spectrum with our own eyes. So who right. knows what these guys are looking at? They see crap that probably to us is not even there. It's not even real. Right. It's how they see the portals. <clears throat> it's how they see the portals. And then, oh man, gosh, when we get into dolphins, it's going to be quite a discussion. I'll tell you, that's going to take a whole episode guaranteed. Yeah, it is. Just dolphins. Now we haven't really talked too much about monkeys. Um, I didn't know if you know this, but, but um, what are those gorillas were considered to be cryptids before they were found for real. Whenever anyone described right. these ape men, um, <clears throat> people thought they were talking about chimpanzees or something else. Right. And then it was discovered that gorillas actually exist. Right. Because the gorillas, you know, they would come into a camp after people had left and then they'd be seen and then they'd f flee away, you know? It's like classic cryptid stuff. Right. Imagine yeah. seeing that muscular thing in your camp after leaving in the jungle and you come back and that thing is there going through your crap or something. You'd be so freaked out. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. A, a creature from the dark. Yeah. Have you ever heard of capuchin monkeys? Yeah, I've heard of them. Mm. They're they're mm. like little weird, cute little creatures, right? Yeah. Discovery had this video. So we talked to a contact that we have who is a field biologist in Costa Rica. All right. Now, the Costa Rican capuchin monkeys push their fingers into each other's eyes all the way in their eye sockets. What? One field biologist said the capuchin monkeys do it basically every day and will sit there for over an hour sometimes. It's like both of them are in a trance just pushing one another's eyes. Now, the scientists don't know if they're touching some type of nerve ending uh, or what, because they also do it up each other's noses. They'll actually stick the finger way up, way up the nose as well. And so it seems like it's some sort of centralized nerve or something like that. Scientists guess, well, this is what they say, is that it's some type of bond test, but they don't know why it's happening. <laughs> Basically, if you don't attack me when I poke you in the eye, you're trustworthy. That's what scientists think. But if you think about it, you know, lobotomies were done for humans straight through the eye up into the up into the brain, right? What if they're like massaging some type of gland or part of their brain that activates something that's slightly more transcendental or psychedelic? Right. I mean, that's kind of like where I'm getting the feeling this is going in these in these animals, I think that they're probably triggering some type of altered state of consciousness. Obviously, they're triggering an altered state of consciousness. It isn't about bonding necessarily. Maybe there's an aspect of that, but it does feel like there's some sort of transcendence thing going on here by pushing on a nerve ending, causing a different thing in the brain to occur. Probably like, we got to find that banana. We got You got to go psychic on me, buddy. Let me stick my fingers in your eye and push that button. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's probably the equivalent of just tripping out for like a while. Right. I mean, just just sitting. These are monkeys. They they move constantly. They can't sit still. And we're talking about them chilling and just pushing one another's eyeballs for hours on end. <laughs> so wait, so literally like like they 
will stick the fingers in the eyes, like like what Dude, going around the eyeball, right? And yeah. pushing behind the eye. Whoa. And then they Something's chill out. In there. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't even know the answer to that. I just think it's. I don't bizarre. either. I don't even know. Okay, that's that's like another thing to remote <clears throat> to remote view here. You got to write that down, they're, dude. They're like all the way in the eye socket. Those fingers are going way in there, and then they're doing it through the nose too, which means there's something behind the eye that these right. critters are pushing, and they love <laughs> the effects of it. And how the heck did they discover that? I mean, that's it's a, that. It's got to be like like hard coded into their DNA to do something like this, right? I mean. What, what What is going on? I'm going to have this looked at. This is something we're going to look at. I almost guarantee they're hitting the their little monkey pineal gland and something's happening. Right. And um, yeah, I mean, scientists are watching them in the jungle do this all the time. It's like it's a known thing. No one really knows what the heck's going on. We're going to find out. We should have a conference where we just bring everyone into a room and everyone pokes each other's eyes until they figure out what's going on. See what happens. I mean, heck, you know, I, there, there could be a similarity here. We literally could discover something that even poking humans in the eye is going to cause a transcendental state of consciousness. And then we're going to have a whole society around it. Again, I think it's very strange when you think about Maybe. like the lobotomy, like what they're yeah. doing. You know, like it, they were sticking something up there, and if you tapped it, it the guy the memory's gone; it's blank. You're just right. you know totally injured from then on. Right. So they're right. not obviously doing that with a metal tool, but they're touching something in there that's creating some kind of state. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna figure this one out. This is this mm -hmm. is too weird for me. Okay, I have to say, of land animals that I've looked into. I had did not stay longer on any one animal than the elephant. Yeah. The I elephant. mean, look, I mean, yeah, elephants are one of the most incredible creatures on this planet. Every part of the elephant is wild. I mean, the, and not just that, the actions, they're way more advanced than normal land animals right. in, in ways that, that I will explain to everybody at home, we're talking about, you know how, okay, yeah. Wait, are you like Ele lecturing your family on elephants? Is that what you're just saying? I'm gonna, The way I've explained to everybody at home? Are you just, are you sit you know, the literally way that sitting I'm, in <laughs> The way that I'm going to explain to everyone at home is what I'm Okay, at. oh, gotcha. Yeah. I thought, I just imagined you with like a whiteboard, like your family. I might, <laughs> that's how crazy this subject is. Okay, so. Some facts about elephants, if you if you were interested in elephants, elephants have been seen recognizing when a woman is pregnant and touching her stomach. They will see that a woman is pregnant and all of them will come over and they start with their um, trunks. They just start kind of like surveying the area and then they tell other elephants about it and they'll come over. So they, you know, and not all animals can do this, but they can actually recognize themselves in a mirror. And this has been tested by some people even putting like an X of tape on their head. And when the elephant sees himself in the mirror, they're with their trunk trying to take the tape off of their head. Yeah. So they know it's them. Right. It's not them right. seeing an, a creature and thinking it's someone else that they have to attack or whatever, which you see often in the animal world, right? Excuse me. It's like paint, not tape. So they would actually paint that on them. Um, Seems nicer to like, put tape on, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Well, if it's, I can see why. The, if you put if you put tape on, they would feel it right away, and they'd be trying to take it off right, right away. But right. if you just no, you got paint, a point. Yeah, they wouldn't. Yeah, <clears throat> elephants mourn their dead, and they have elephant graveyards. Okay, now <clears throat> there have been elephants that were caught shaking down humans for bananas. Some of these elephants yeah. get aggressive. They want a banana. They'll come get you. Um. One elephant out there, you've probably seen these videos. It was taught, I, I don't know how this happened, honestly. Uh, like, I think people are, are writing this off way too easily, but there was an elephant that was taught to paint another elephant. Did you see that? I haven't Those seen videos? that. This is actually an elephant painting other elephants. Seriously? Seriously. And you can that, see the whole video. That's actually an elephant painting right there? Yeah. The, and like the elephant, and the thing that... I find bizarre about this is how do you teach 
an elephant to do like think about the process you'd have to go through it's not like you have normal communication with this thing right you you are you showing it first and then you're telling it to copy you know right i'm not really sure this is an uh, an asian elephant so this is an this is an elephant from india you can tell by the shape of its ear and the size of its ear the african elements elephants have ears so big they're actually more shaped like the entire continent of africa which i have a theory about it's very and and they say that this the ears of the of the elephants in india are shaped like india isn't that strange <laughs> that is really strange yeah so literally their ear is shaped like the indian continent for real yeah or or like the african continent if you're from there and they're much huh. bigger the ones wait in what's your theory on that I think that these, I think these animals are a, a product of the continent that they're on. And just like, if you, if you research Chinese medicine, um, you eat things that are the shape of the part of the body that you want to improve. So if you want to improve kidneys, you eat beans, you eat things that look like that, right? right celery right. improves your ligaments because the celery is, is str ligament like, yeah, yes. Now, why would we think that we human beings or other animals are any different than the entire earth that we're on? We're all connected, right? Right. right. So it would make sense then that certain parts of our body actually take on characteristics of the place. If we're connected and tied into that place and elephants by nature are earth beings by right. all account. I right. mean, we're talking about like the Mac daddy of earth beings. Right. Right. Yeah. They, I mean. When you okay, so when you get into the whole like like realm of remote viewing, um, specific animals and where they come from, I haven't seen element uh, elephants as being from necessarily elsewhere. There does seem to be this this genetic birthing connection between this earth and elephants in general. Whether they are man manipulated genetically or not, I have no idea. I haven't seen anything like that, but they are, they are like, what is it? It's like, it's like they are, they are, like what we've seen with elephants is they understand the mechanics of the earth is what it, what it looks like in remote viewing data. Like they're extremely intelligent. Yes. They're very intelligent in the way that whales are intelligent, where when you look into their eyes, there's some knowing some wisdom that's like hard to explain right yeah there's there's absolutely something there and i mean elephants are so like so interesting they're they're they were found to use medicine and they eat plants to induce labor they eat specific plants to induce labor this is advanced yeah. guys yeah yeah and then, of course, elephant skin is wrinkled on purpose with layers and later layers. As they get older, they have more and more layers. And it's a sponge that can absorb water, which is important for an animal with so much surface area to cool off. So the layers of skin are there to absorb. It's a sponge to absorb the water, and then it keeps and retains the water. And this is how they survive in, in these extremely hot temperatures. Right, right. And they have no sweat glands. Well, they have some sweat glands above their nails on their, well, they can sweat through, I should say, a, an area right above their nails on their feet, right? But this, the hairs that they have, you know, those little janky elephant hairs, those <laughs> help them cool off. People but that's the scientific hair. name, if you guys didn't know, the janky elephant hairs. Janky elephant hairs. <laughs> Coined here on Metaphysical. Now, you know, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of people uh, assume that elephant ears are just fans and it just helps them cool down their body. There's a lot of blood vessels and this is true. There's a lot of blood vessels in the ears. The blood goes through the ears, it cools off and then circulates back into the body. There's so many blood vessels in those ears that it helps them cool off because they have no other way of cool. I mean, they're literally a gigantic sponge that is just getting hammered with heat right now. This is where it gets a little interesting is elephants might not get cancer because they're so hot they've developed extra proteins that help in protecting and repairing heat damaged sperm so that they can huh. 
procreate. That's really interesting. Because where their sperm is, is the hottest part of the body. And so they would have to develop proteins to repair those. Because as you know, actually, if you don't know at home, your testes are supposed to be a cooler uh, cooler because it, it, it's better for the sperm if it's cool. So these animals do not have any protect, fr- they're not protected from that. So they have to have another method to protect the sperm. Yeah. And don't put your laptop on your lap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't put your laptop on your lap. Okay. They, they also use teamwork all the time. They have their smelling abilities are super strong. They can recognize scents after more than a decade. Like, so they can sniff the dung of another elephant that was their child that they haven't seen in 12 years. And then f- they get all excited because they know who it is <laughs> that I've seen videos of this. It's not me saying this, right? Okay. Now another pretty interesting, before we get into the next uh, part of this whole dig, which is the most insane part. Probably an interesting fact is that Buddha Sakyamuni's mother had a vision of a white elephant before he was born. So there was some part of the elephant culture very ingrained in the Indian, uh, in the ancient Indian culture, for sure. Okay, now we got to talk more about those elephant ears and something that I'm calling seismosis. And I have no idea why scientists didn't coin that term. And I had to coin it here on metaphysical because that's exactly what this is. They now seismosis would be the process of earthquake making. Now, if you guys want the lead on this, the most interesting lead I found was from Caitlin O'Connell Rodwell. She is like the, she developed this very unorthodox, I would say way of studying elephants. She was studying cicada-like insects before that communicate with each other uh, basically by sending out vibrations over the stems of plants, right? So that's a really interesting field. And I think if she didn't study that first, I don't think she ever would have discovered this, what she, what she discovered with, with elephants. Elephants communicate by rumbling the earth. They can send pounds on the ground that create seismic waves to tell others where water is transmitting information, and it can transmit miles and miles using the earth. That's incredible. I mean, if you think about a highly social being, they're incredibly social. And if they, okay, so like, if somebody came from the outside, like we are on the outside of elephants, if somebody came from the outside of humans, they and they had not developed the the way that we use sound, like like if you think about language and humans, it's extremely complicated. We make various sounds and all these different patterns, and every sound means something different. I mean, the words coming out of my mouth are just sounds that I learned how to make in order to relay information to you because we're incredibly social. If you came from the outside of that, you would think, and you didn't have that developed, you would go, wow, this is just amazingly incredible that these, this species can make all these different sounds and it relay information. Now we look at those elephants and what they do not having the vocal cords, the expansive vocal cords that we do, they use their body to make vibrations in the ground to communicate different things. How utterly fascinating is that? Yes. That is crazy. It's way crazier than anyone realizes because not only do they do things like communicate through the earth, if they cannot figure out where a sound is coming from, Elephants will join together, arrange themselves like a compass to see which direction someone's signal is coming from. There are videos of this. Seriously. So like, so, so they will kind of go in a circle all pointed out. Is that what you mean? And then their their butts are all facing in and they're in four directions and they're trying to figure out where the seismic waves are coming from. (laughs) Their ears are not just ears. We're talking about satellites, dude, that are picking this stuff up. Right, right, right. And it's not just their ears. What I found in my research 
is that they are bypassing their ears and going straight to the eardrums through the bones. Their feet, which have layers and layers of fat, are picking up the, the, the waves, the low frequency waves from the earth. They're traveling through their bones and delivering information directly into the ears. Wow. So, so, so they have this whole language built around vibrations. Yes, and specific and vocal... vibrations mean certain things. And I, you got to wonder how, how they learn this, how they're taught this. And they're, they're, it's, it's through their feet, but their vocal cords, which are very thick vocal cords, communicate these low frequency waves through their feet as well into the earth. We're talking about multiple things communicating through the earth, traveling miles and miles. Right, right. This is this is the most complicated form of language through the earth I've ever right. even discovered or heard about. Right. <clears throat> Their biology. Yeah, okay, so an elephant just looks like this massive thick creature, but their biology is so fine-tuned and sensitive to vibration in general that it's turned into a language for them. And they pass this language down to their offspring. How amazing is that it's crazy yeah i never and like i how come we don't i i just this is the first time i've ever heard of this i mean this information is out there don't get me wrong it's like i just haven't been educated on this but it's it's incredible okay so this is kind of more of the the, the language behind all of this so seismic communication works with elephants because of the incredible sensitivity of their feet. Like all mammals, including humans, elephants have receptors called Piscinian corpuscles or PCs in their skin. So these PCs are hardwired to a part of the brain where touch signals are processed called the somatosensory cortex. <laughs> so strictly speaking, when elephants pick up ground vibrations in their feet, it's their sense of feeling, not hearing at work. Typically, hearing happens without physical contact when airborne vibrations hit the eardrum, causing the tiny bones of the inner ear to tremble and transmit a message to the brain along the auditory nerve. They, they get it through the bone and it goes straight. They get these seismic right. waves through the it's bone a, and it goes straight to their eardrum. It's a somatic, it's a somatic language, basically. Yeah, so it's like... Um, Okay, so so in the whole realm of like remote viewing, you have the subconscious would be considered the body. The the body is more the subconscious. In remote viewing, it's very it, it it should be more somatic than what it is because the way we remote view is that that it it literally comes from the body, right? It doesn't come from here. Like this is the translation device. Now elephants seem to exist more on that somatic side. And the somatic side is the subconscious. And this is actually what we see with animals. We see that the animals, when we do consciousness mapping, so we have a method of consciousness mapping in remote viewing. And when you look at humans, humans are very fragmented. <clears throat> humans have the conscious and the subconscious and all these like little compartmentalization skills so that we can't access a lot of what's in the subconscious when we're always in the conscious. When you get to animals and especially elephants, their, their existence doesn't have all the fragments. Their consciousness doesn't have all the fragments that we have and they have more they have access to what we would consider subconscious and within the subconscious exists a different type of communication when you get into telepathy and whatnot that's where that exists that's the whole communication realm of animals and when we've looked at elephants with remote viewing they have a huge capacity now what you're saying is what scientists have discovered which is absolutely fascinating but what they don't know is that elephants have a since they have this deep, well, what we would call subconscious connection, or they exist that way, they're able to communicate through non-verbal means, non-body means, everything, just projection, because they are in the group mind in a sense, more so. So that, that this really, this is like the other aspect of elephants and a lot of animals that, that science completely misses is the telepathic side. No, a hundred percent. Yeah. And who knows like how complicated 
that communication gets if you add in that layer. Exactly. Right. It, it, it's something beyond our understanding. Right. You know? Right. And I do believe that elephants probably communicate these types of understanding on the physical side to their offspring in telepathic ways. Um, look at like Anna was getting images from the animal in form. And this is how animals communicate. They will give imagery, right? And they won't give words because they don't use language. The, the brain can translate into words, but they will give imagery. And the, the, the panther gave her imagery of what his concerns were. And when she gave the imagery back of not no need to have these types of concerns and whatnot, then the animal opened up and began to have different interactions with the ah. people who were, you know, um, uh, keeping it in the preserve. And, and, and this is where humans really miss out. This mm -hmm. is more on the subconscious realm. This is the place that you can go to in order to actually talk to your pets to talk to your dogs, your cats, to understand what it is they need or to give them direction on what you need. I mean, I used to communicate with my dog through nonverbal means by sending, sending her images. Like for instance, if I wanted her to get a very specific toy, I would put the image in my head and just look at her and make sure she got that image, like move it out, push it out. And then she would go get that exact toy never fail that worked it always worked always wow. worked it's just that humans have lost this ability that most animals have right and elephants have got this this is like this is this is i think it's important for people to begin to like get this ability back and it's very simple everybody has a pet or knows somebody who has a pet and it's an easy thing to practice yeah i guess what you were just talking about um reminded me of that bunny the dog uh, clip that we had that man, I don't know if you saw this, but that clip got like 23 or 22 million views on TikTok alone. It's yeah. at 7.6 yeah, or seven yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. I mean, it, this dog, you know, it starts to communicate and then it got more and more, or it became more and more confused about it and what it was and whether it was human. And I mean, it right. Was like, right. Because you're forcing the dog to use language, to use your language in order to communicate, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, at least we think that's what's going on there with Bunny the dog. And it's really an interesting thing to be able to do. But what if you stepped into the dog's realm? Dogs will telepathically communicate. They know how to do that because they don't have necessarily built up language skills like we do and the complicated vocal cords. Or the notions keeping them from doing it. I mean, how right. many how many times a day do you get images that just pop into your head and you don't track down the source of those images and why they came into your head. When Riley doesn't care about a memory, it fades. Fade? Happens to the best of them. Yeah, except for this bad boy. <laughs> this one will never fade. <laughs> Triple that gum. We'll make you <gasps> the song from the gum commercial. You know, sometimes we send that one up to headquarters for no reason. It plays in Riley's head over and over again, like a million times. <laughs> Let's watch it again. But if you did, you might find something really weird. I mean, there have been times when I've had someone's image pop into my head and I've called them and been like, hey, is everything going on? Is everything going on OK right now? Like and they've been like, wow, how did you know to call me? And I've been like, I don't know. Right. Like, I just I don't know. You know, I try right. not to explain it, but I do think that there is these weird receptors that we have that can pick up on these things if you're sensitive and you track it down and you follow it instead of just thinking you're out of your mind or something like that, which we've been told. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's something we all have. It's just, nobody really practices it, but it's easy to practice. Go to the zoo, communicate with other animals at the zoo. I don't know, go outside, talk to the birds. They, you will get information. You will, you will get things from them. And it's not something that is the fantasy of the mind. If you go at it from the standpoint of clearing your mind first, going into a thoughtless place, meditative, thoughtless place, this is the thing. So, okay, we live in a continent here in the United States and Europe and Australia and New Zealand and whatnot. I think a lot of our audience comes from these locations in general, right? We don't have culturally, we don't have elephants like deep throughout our culture we don't have that here but when you get and so this is the really interesting part for me is that when you get to africa 
when you get to Asia, you have a rich history of elephant mythology that is untapped from our perspective in understanding yeah. these creatures, especially when you get to Africa. And I think this is a place that is a huge void that I think we need to fill. I think I need to figure out, we need to like go into deeper research on, on the, the myth, mythology, the cultural connections to yes. the elephant, because the elephant is a highly intel intelligent, telepathic creature that is going to have stoked gazillions of stories with Dude, they were they were considered like sacred in ancient india these right. things are communicating through the earth they're literally using the earth to communicate i that's mind blowing right yeah what are what are these things <laughs> they're literally a representation of the earth and biological form right right I, there's just like that whole, like their ears being the shape of the, of the continent that they live on is freaking me out. Yeah. It raises more questions than it answers here. So. It really does. But that's kind of what this show is all about, isn't it? I mean, we, we dig in there, we find strange things, and then we have to ask these questions because the world is just way more amazing than I think people realize. Well, yeah. So we're going to have to potentially come back to this i think if we can look into this a little bit more i'd love to find more lore on elephants and and revisit this at some point yeah i think that's i think that's a definite i'm going to be doing that that's for sure yeah excellent excellent well you guys if you're listening at home uh, i hope you enjoyed this episode we went through a bunch of very strange animals and um they're different ways of communicating um just they help us see the world in a different way and i hope you guys feel that way too uh john thanks so much for being with us uh and for those of you at home uh we really hope that you guys thought that this episode was as out of this world as we did we'll see you next time